Deputy of Eight Minutes. Uh, Gurum Agat, uh, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to make a few um, a, a few points uh, in relation to the upcoming European Council meeting, but also the inaugural meeting of the European political community, which I think is something that has been long overdue but extremely welcome. It's something for everyone in the, the orbit of the European Union, uh, aspirant member states and former member states, another forum that is much needed in a time where talking has never been so important. And I think they have to put on record that the European Union historically has sadly treated many applicant and accession countries quite badly. They've strung them along, they've put them on the long finger. Um, while at times there is obvious need for domestic reforms, I think it's not always uh, the responsibility of um, accession countries, but also the European Union to ease that process. But I think this is a very welcome step forward. And what I'd ask ministers, this is at the very initial stages and it's being done on a head of government basis, which is welcome. But I think there has to be in due course an opportunity uh, for both an interparliamentary element, but also an interministerial element to the, a future European uh, political community if it is to genuinely have a real endorsement from member state parliaments but also to have the teeth and I think um, crucially and I'll, I'll speak more on the Anglo-Irish relationship in, in conclusion Cahirlik, but I think particularly when it comes to um, Ireland-UK uh, relationships the ability to meet colleagues in the margins like yourself in European Council meetings or for parliamentarians at COSAC meetings or anything else has been massively um, diminishing to the relationship I and mean, it's been very evident after a very difficult couple of months which we all hope is starting to turn some form of albeit moving corner and I think the European political community, the Council of Europe, the OSCE, the OECD, all these bodies all these interparliamentary assemblies, we have to see a more formal formalising of relationships and engagements um, between uh, ourselves and our British colleagues at an interparliamentary and intergovernmental level, um, notwithstanding, of course, the, the desperate need for to see the, the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement back up and fully running in due course. Um, moving on, Cairo, to the European uh, Council meeting uh, later on this week, I think, of course, like others, I do welcome the eighth round of sanctions uh, in relation to Russia, but I, I still fear that you know, in the next month or six weeks, we will, of course, be talking about a, a ninth and inevitably a tenth round of sanctions. Um, and the scenes over the last couple of days of indiscriminate Russian bombing of Ukraine has stand that. But I think what, what I've been making the point repeatedly, uh, Cahirlik, at a European Council living meeting, it's not just good enough about sanctions on Russia or indeed on Belarus, which we've seen and we've seen extensively, but also the third party actors, the actors that fuel the Russian war machine. Uh, as we are led to believe that the Iranian government has uh, provided the drones for so much of the awful scenes that we've seen over the last couple of days. But I also think more widely, Minister, of those um, other, mem other third parties, other, other states that the European Union has extremely detailed and important relationships with, other countries that benefit from very, um, very lucrative trade deals and other relationships with the European Union who simply haven't put any sanctions against uh, Vladimir Putin's vicious regime, or if they have, you know, they're fairly light touch to say the, to say the least. And of course, crucially, the biggest failures in that regard are within the European Union itself or within member states who are allowing the loopholes, who are flagrantly breaching the sanctions or allowing business as usual to carry on as it suits them. And I think that's somewhere that we have to get our own house in order, First Minister, in terms of the European Union, but also, crucially, we have to make the point to other member states and other countries and states around the world that if you wish to continue to have a really good, profitable, lucrative relationship with the European Union on an economical, cultural and societal level, then you need to start taking firm, genuine action against Vladimir Putin and his war machine. And I think, moving on, Keir, look, when we look at the how this ties in most crucially, of course, to the situation in relation to energy supply um, as we edge ever closer to the depths of winter and how much this is really going to start to have a huge impact in every household um, across the European Union and, and, of course, much wider. We see the absolute targeting by the Russian regime of um, energy plants and um, power plants in Ukraine, making sure they've already used food as a weapon of war. Now they're going to use um, energy and the ability to heat one's home as a weapon of war. It's an absolute vile approach. But when we look um, and a European Union context uh, with regard to the, to the real needs of this European Council meeting, it's actually for a genuine swift decision for that level of intervention when it comes to the so-called windfall tax or it comes to engaging with energy companies. Because there's no point individual 
particularly smaller member states going it alone, um, and it's disappointing when bigger member states go it alone. But as we've seen, for example, in comparison with the vaccine rollout, when we work as a collective, as an EU27, that's how genuine uh, improvement can be made. And I'd implore, I'd implore Minister that this week that we actually see uh, clear action at the European Council meeting when it comes to energy, clear action that can be translated quite clearly um, to the bills of people at home or of their businesses to say this is something that the European Union has done and this is a saving that the European Union is ensuring that every uh, EU citizen um, can make the most of in, in advance of extremely difficult times. Um, one of the other key points Cahirlik, that will be discussed of course is the economy and we obviously are aware of the impact of the war and one of the areas I wanted to focus on Minister was in relation to the resilience funds you know these were born out of the, the COVID-19 pandemic a global pandemic that we hadn't the likes of which hadn't been seen for a century but they're going to have a much greater need now a much more diverse need and I think that changing set of circumstances needs to be reflected in an ability for flexibility to allow member states to tweak their own resilience plans but crucially for the European Commission to respond to any tweaks or alterations by member states in a genuinely swift manner. Uh, myself and Deputy John Lahart uh, on behalf of the Finance and Budgetary Oversight Committee attended a European Presidency meeting in Prague where this very point was made that there is a huge concern that the needs of resilience and recovery plans will change and or have changed but unfortunately the European Commission is being too slow in that response to member states. Um, and of course more widely on the economy we look at the, the results by the ESRI report um, the collection of data um, that they combined in the report in relation to the UK's trading relationship uh, with Ireland and uh, the EU and how that has so drastically changed since Brexit, the massive drop in trade uh, east-west or indeed uh, west-east um, from Great Britain to the EU and it's something that is obviously a huge concern. We always said the impacts of Brexit will be masked by the pandemic and now it's being masked by uh, the war in Ukraine and the related crises that fall, that fall out of it. But I I think it's something where we really need to, and in close here, look, we really need to see that increasing emphasis on engagement between Ireland and our European Union member state partners. The fact that only 6% of SMEs are exporting to the continent, to continental European Union, I think is extremely worrying and it shows the opportunity in this extremely challenging times for Irish businesses and the wider economy to limit the damage of Brexit and indeed the more, uh, the more general economic challenges that are presenting and try and offset it as best possible.